Hello, everyone. We just had a nice victory on the floor of the house for H.R. 8. Now we're moving on to H.R. 40, 1446. So here we are. One year ago today, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus, the COVID-19, a pandemic. A pandemic. Uh, about on that day, by then, a thousand Americans had been infected. About 38 had died from the pandemic. Here we are a year later, as we observe that sad moment and everything that has ensued from them, with over 500,000 Americans who have died, uh, around 30 million have become infected, and uh, again, our hearts are broken for them, their fa for their families, and for all of those who are affected by the coronavirus. But we also today are celebrating legislation that will make a tremendous difference. President Biden's American Rescue Plan is a plan to crush the virus and to save lives and livelihood of the American people. It is historic, it is monumental, it is consequential. Uh, and I said it's probably the most consequential legislation most of us will ever, many of us will ever vote for in the Congress. I put it on the par with the Affordable Care Act as having serious consequences for the well being of the American people. The Biden plan uh, will make an immediate difference in people's lives, injecting vaccine into their arms, money into their pockets children going back into school safely, and people going to work safely. Uh, so it is, it's just remarkable. It's remarkable legislation. Unfortunately, Republicans, as I say, you know, vote no and take the dough. You see already some of them claiming, oh, this is a good thing or that's a good thing, but they couldn't give it a vote. But anyway, enough of them. I talked about children in school. Uh, when I talked about this legislation yesterday, I talked about it in terms of America's children. Uh, children are my why, why I went from housewife to house speaker, uh, uh, because of the children, that one in five children in America lives in poverty. As a mother of five, I couldn't abide that and wanted to make a difference in public policy. One in five goes to sleep hungry at night, hungry at night. That was even before the coronavirus. And I've always said that the three most important issues facing the Congress are our children, our children, our children. Their health, their education, the economic security of their families, including the pension security for their grandparents, and an uh, environment in which they can thrive safely, a world at peace in which they can reach their fulfillment. Well, the first three of those, their health, their education, and the economic security of their families was very much affected by the Biden American Rescue Plan. We're very proud of what it does for children, their health, their education, and the economic security of their families. Today on the floor, we go to that fourth place, a safe environment in which our children can thrive by passing the background check legislation. It's hard to imagine legislation being more popular than the rescue plan, 75%, whatever. This legislation, background checks, closer to 90%. Bipartisan support across the country. Receiving the support of gun owners, hunters, and the rest. They've all had to do a background check. Why shouldn't others? Our chairman of the task force, Mike Thompson, is, is a hunter, is a veteran, and is a gun owner. And he has had, again, protective of the First Amendment rights of gun owners, but also protective of the survival of our children. So I see this issue through the eyes of our children. I tell my colleagues the stories when I go to like a child care center in my district a few years, several years ago. We're playing on the floor with stuff, and all of a sudden a balloon burst, and the kids yell, drop four-year-old children yelling drop and that is not unusual in certain communities what are we doing to the 
our children. As Senator Murphy this morning in our press conference talked about what it does uh, to, to the well-being of children to live in a dangerous atmosphere. And so we all know about the children in Newtown, and I thought for sure we would get gun violence legislation, gun violence prevention legislation passed then, but they said no time and time again. Florida, Nevada, you name it, all over the country. So here we are with this legislation, and we're very optimistic that with 90% support in the public and with a public awareness, uh, again, the drumbeat created by the people out there, the survivors of gun violence, we told them we're not resting until we get this job done. And today we're taking a giant a step in that direction for the children. And as I say about these members of Congress, there's not, uh, if you're afraid to vote for gun violence prevention because of your political survival, understand this, the political survival of none of us is more important than the survival of our children and the fear that they have of this. So I, as I've said about the, uh, the um, uh, rescue package, how great it was. Uh, we sent it over to uh, the Senate in a, uh, a package that had been uh, negotiated. Uh, there were some changes, not much, so that we could receive it back in terms of the essence of the bill. But one important part of it that did not survive the bird rule or the bird lady or whatever it is over there was the minimum wage. And we will persist with the minimum wage. Now, what I want you to understand is because so many times you hear people say, well, I'm for a $10 minimum wage or I'm for an $11 minimum wage. Well, understand what the fight for 15 has been all about. It's about a fight for 15 where by 2025, people will arrive at $15. So if you're for a $10 raise the minimum wage now, it's only $9.50 in this year, 2021, $11 in 2022, $12.50 in 2023, $14 in 2024, and finally $15 in 2025. I've been fighting for the fight for 15 for a number of years. Quite frankly, I think it should be higher, but this is the fight that we are in. So if you think it's okay to have a $10 minimum wage, we don't even get there this year. We don't even get there this year. When we passed the bill in 2007, it was one of the first bills we passed in the first 100 hours of the new uh, Democratic majority. It was one of our fight for, uh, uh, six for six, you know, the uh, six for oh six that we had, uh, six bills, we passed it, we sent it to the Senate it, it didn't make it there, but we put it in an appropriations bill, and it passed. For, first, we passed it, and President Bush vetoed it, but then we put it in an appropriations bill, and then it was passed and signed by the president. So it was a fight then for $7.25, really. Um, and um, I tell the story that when we, when we went outside to celebrate, Senator Kennedy who was the leader of it as the chairman of the health committee in the Senate, he came to the podium and he said, you know what we have to do now? We have to raise the minimum wage because he knew that 725 wasn't even enough then. But here it is, 950, can you live on 950? Family of four, both parents making the minimum wage, 725, still under the poverty line. And by the way, a low substandard minimum wage is corporate welfare. It is subsidizing the private sector not to reward work. And well, how do we subsidize it? Medicaid, food uh, 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 assistance, housing assistance, and the rest. So the taxpayer is subsidizing the low minimum wage for the private sector. Fortunately, not everybody in the private sector thinks that way, and they respect the dignity of work, and many of them have come closer to a, not even a living wage, but at least a higher 
minimum wage. So this is, a, they're just, we're not giving up on that. We're not giving up on gun violence prevention. We've told the survivors again and again, we, we're not going away. We will persist until the law is changed and we have safety for our children. So again, this is a hopeful time and I wanna praise, of course, Senator Schumer, Leader Schumer for his uh, uh, leadership and sending us back a bill that we did not have to amend or go to conference on because it re resembled enough what we had sent over there. Except for the minimum wage. And we'll find a path on that. So uh, again, one year ago, declared a pandemic. In the course of that time, declared a hoax, all the rest of that, avoiding science and the rest, and now truly an attempt to crush the virus. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ma yeah. And then, uh, all right, Garrett. You sure. uh, so when you have been focused on COVID, the Republicans have been talking about immigration. When you were focused on the Voting Rights Act, they were talking about immigration. Today, you're talking about Fight for 15. Today, they're talking about immigration. I'm wondering if House Democrats, if you guys, if, why, why are we not seeing the same thing? Are, is this a distraction on their part? Is it a mistake for House Democrats to not include immigration elements earlier in the agenda? I'm just trying to square how these two parties are talking about such different things as the key issue right now. Well, I guess their Dr. Zeus approach didn't work for them, so now they've had to change the subject. Uh, but we do not uh, 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 prioritize our values and how we can get make a difference in the lives of the American people uh, to be attuned to the bankruptcy of ideas that the Republicans have. No, there was no mistake. The bill is, except for the minimum a minimum wage, uh, again, certain tweaks here and there, which were not uh, consequential. The bill is what we all agree to as the priorities to save lives and livelihoods, shots in the arm, money in the pockets, kids in the school safely, and workers back in their jobs. Yes, sir. Madam Speaker, I just wanted to ask you about the uh, surge of unaccompanied minors at the southern border. The Biden administration has acknowledged that the humanitarian effort that they have may be an incentive for them to come. What would you like to see done out there? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't heard them say that that would be an incentive. I do think what they are doing is talking to regional governments to say, keep them home, as well as if they have a, uh, a case for uh, um, refugee status or asylum seekers to have that adjudicated in the, have those interviews happen in the country of origin. Uh, but for those who are coming, uh, they have a humane uh, policy about how they, as quickly as possible, and it takes time because you want to do it right, can, and can get them uh, uh, situated in, with, with family member or safe place for them to be. And uh, it, it will be nothing like what we saw in the Trump administration of PBs being snatched from the arms of their parents. Uh, to me, as a mom and a grandmother, that to me is like the most vile, with stiff competition from the, the Trump administration, but one of the most vile things they did. So I think that the, uh, uh, I, I trust uh, the Biden administration's policy to be based on humanitarian uh, and love of children rather than uh, political points or red meat for their ba for their Republican base. Now, let me just say one thing about asylum seekers. Four years ago, around now, the the president, then president, uh, uh, put a ban, a Muslim ban, in place. Uh, the same women who marched the day after the inauguration saw the power of their presence. And many of them marched to the airports and to other venues to protest the Muslim ban. But not only them, they were an example to others. And you saw an outpouring of disapproval of what the president was doing. We then had a, 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 a session here. It couldn't be a hearing because we were in the minority, but we had a rump meeting about asylum seekers and, and opposition to the Muslim ban. 
We had the military come and say, how could they do this? We promised our interpreters and others who helped us in Iraq and Afghanistan who are Muslim that they could come to the United States, and this is hurting our security. We had our diplomats, maybe a thousand signed a letter, which was unusual, that many, uh, but them to testify about how this was bad for our national security from a diplomatic standpoint. We had uh, economists saying this is bad for our economy in terms of the intellectual resources uh, that we were depriving our country of. But why I bring it up is we had a, representatives, a representative of the American Evangelicals Association or the Association of American Evangelicals. And what he said at that meeting that I think everybody should continue to remember because the evangelicals have been really good on immigration and on asylum seekers and refugees. He said, the United States refugee resettlement program is the crown jewel of American humanitarianism. And that was at a time when the administration was preparing to reduce the number that we received while encouraging other countries to take other asylum seekers. So it is, um, it is, you know, it's a, a value decision that we have to make. And I, I, I think the difference between this administration and the one before is great in terms of how we meet the needs of these children, placing them as much as possible with family, but in other safe uh, homes, and in the meantime, to have uh, a humanitarian uh, reception for them wherever they are. It is a, it's a big, it's a big, when, when, I'll just tell you this one more thing. I took a group, a, uh, before COVID, so it was the, the last trip that I was able to take to Central America, to the Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, to see what was happening there in terms of dangerous situations that people were escaping, and, and that was the reason why they would risk crossing a desert, because they would die if they stayed home, uh, and their children as well. Uh, uh, what were the economic situations? What, what was it that we could help them with to keep people home? Because people really genuinely do like to stay home. One of the things that was interesting on that trip was that member, a number of the uh, people who were leaving for economic reasons were farmers because the, the drought had caused such a severe situation in the Northern Triangle, they could no longer farm. It was, what was arable before was no longer arable. Again, a climate issue, a climate issue. And so there are all kinds of ways that we can help people be successful at, uh, or comfortable, at least, at home rather than coming to the United States, but to recognize there are many reasons why they do. Some because of the dangerous situation to their lives, and we could spend all day going on chapter and verse of all the young people we met and how they feared for their lives in the communities they were, uh, they were in. Madam yes, sir. Madam Speaker. Um, since the president has already started meeting with lawmakers from both parties on infrastructure, uh, it seems like that may be the next legislative agenda item to, for the Biden administration. Curious, your thoughts on the size and scope of a deal, considering that the $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill got zero Republican votes in Congress. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the question. It's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, the, the infrastructure, we like to call it, you know, jobs uh, legislation, is... Uh, it's so important because it's about jobs. It's about uh, quality of life for people when we have better roads and transit systems and the rest to have them spend less time in their cars, more time at home. A 45-minute ride, which should be a 20 or 15-minute ride, should that's a quality of life issue. What that means in terms of clean air uh, for our children and grandchildren to breathe. So it's a a quality of life issue in many respects in terms of time, but also in times of clean air. Again, a jobs, jobs, jobs issue, not only in the construction of these projects, but also the commerce it, it uh, enables to happen. And in farm country where uh, time is important in terms of product, uh, produce from 
from field to, or from farm to market and the rest, time, time, time. So the list goes on and on. And uh, it's not just roads and bridges at, at, and mass transit and high-speed rail. That it's also about water systems. Some of the water systems that we have now are 100, over 100 years old. I've been saying this for 10 years, so they're over 110 years old. They're made of brick and wood. We really need to address the water systems in our country. And one of my colleagues, uh, Congresswoman Tlaib, has been on this case uh, uh, in terms of safe water uh, for our children all over the country, as, as has Dan Kildee representing uh, Flint, Michigan, and the rest. So it's about that. But it's also about infrastructure. We see in all of this uh, telemedicine, uh, distance learning, commerce uh, through the internet, family interactions and the rest. So that, that piece of the intersect uh, infrastructure, which might not have been one we had 20 years ago, is important now. So and, and the, for these and other reasons, schools, housing, all that. But remember this, this has always been bipartisan for us. In the, many dec in the years I've been in Congress, three decades, it's always been bipartisan. The only time they interfered with that is when President Obama presented his plan and they cut it back. But we still got something, but not as much as was needed uh, uh, by the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. We're way behind where we should be in terms of building the infrastructure. So I would hope it would, because it'll be in their districts. Again, they'll vote no and take the dough, show up at the ribbon cutting and the rest. Uh, so hopefully they will be an intellectual resource as well as to what are the uh, priorities in their region, what has the support of the communities and the rest, uh, and whether it's a water project or, or whatever uh, infrastructure it is. It's very popular with the American people. And the problem we had, we, President uh, uh, Trump always said during the campaign, his, you know, 16 campaign, and since he for a long time, he always talked about infrastructure. I didn't have a conversation with him for the first year and a half, say, that he was in office, that infrastructure was not a part of the conversation. It's just when it came time to pay for it that he stormed out the door. Uh, but but we'll have to pay for some of it. We'll have to find ways to cover um, the fees, et cetera. What, that's all a, a discussion that has to take place now. But there's no question. The most expensive maintenance of our infrastructure is no maintenance. It only just gets worse. And so uh, we see this as a tremendous opportunity all across America, creating jobs, promoting commerce, cleaning the air, improving quality of life. And we hope that it will be bipartisan. Madam Speaker, International so Women's Week, call on a woman. Yeah, yeah. have better. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, thank you, or the oh. other woman. I wanted to ask you, uh, in January, after the insurrection on the Capitol, you said that um, the future security threats, that that was um, something that was in the House, So the security threats were now in the House. I'm, one, I'm wondering what evidence you have. I have I've never, I'm, I've said that that has been alleged. I have never made any characterization of that. That remains for the FBI and others to investigate. What do you got, Chad? So, Chad? More. Thank you so much. So yesterday, the House Administration Committee voted to continue its inquiry into the Iowa 2nd Congressional right. District here. Right. Could you see a scenario, depending on what they find in their probe, of unseating the current number and seating Rita Hart if it came to them? You know, Chad, uh, Chad is always the, uh, the hypothetical. Could you see a scenario? We don't do press conferences on can you see a scenario. Of course. That would be a pretty bold move to yeah. do that. Well, if we, they have, I respect the work of the committee. I did see, as you saw in the press, uh, what they uh, decided to, uh, uh, and, and they were following my, as I read it, the uh, requirements of the law as to how you go forward. And how you go forward is the path you're on, and uh, and we'll see that where that takes us. Yeah, but there could be a scenario to that extent. Yes, Matt, I'm a minimum wage. Will, 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 the, will the Giants win the World Series? Nine fifty, eleven dollars, twelve fifty, fourteen, one. It takes all this time to get to fifteen dollars an hour. 
carry this around in your head and think of how you could live on this, put food on the table, and have the dignity of your work respected. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Mm.